Before we move on to the video, if you are looking for more lease study material, please do not hesitate to contact me on my email and on my LinkedIn. In addition to the material, I have also developed a file in which I have put all the credit categories with their respective names, adaptations to which they apply, their description, their details, furthermore required documentations, formulas, and the standards they follow in a tabular form and color coded. And all the important terminologies related to that credit categories are stated below. Feel free to contact me and I'll be more than happy to share all with you. Sustainable sites, 10 points for all adaptations except for Core and Shell 11, School 12, and Healthcare, 9 points. This is the summary for this category. And if you can see, there are two prerequisites and 11 credits. But at the same time, in the applicable adaptations, the second prerequisite is only for healthcare and schools. And below five, the last five credits are also dedicated to schools, healthcare, and corn shell only. So the remaining credits and the first prerequisite is for all adaptations. So I'm going to cover first the first prerequisite and all the remaining credits that are applicable to all adaptations and then I'll come back to the second prerequisite and the last last uh, five credits. The PR1 is construction activity and pollution prevention and the intent is to reduce pollution from construction by controlling soil erosion and waterway sedimentation. If you have been to a construction site I'm sure you know that there is a lot of dust, there's a lot of cutting going on, there's a lot of uh, metal cutting, wood cutting, and uh, if it is a large so site, a lot of water is used for so many purposes to cool down the equipments. And So what happens is if you do not have a good plan in place where you would know that how would you control this pollution, the idea is that the pollution or or uh, the water, the contaminated water in this case should not go out of the site or you should have a system for the collection of this water and you should have a system to contain all the pollution that is being produced on the site by uh, all the activities. So the requirement is to obtain CGP, stands for Construction General Permit from EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. Now this is all for USA, so you could have uh, an uh, equivalent of the these organizations in, in your own country or we can submit uh, the equivalent uh, documents. Apply ESC plan, that is erosion and sedimentation control plan and this plan should be in place before the construction has begun. So it means that you know how to control all this uh, before erosion is when uh, all this pollutants is taken away by by wind uh, when you disturb the soil or when you when you cut something so all this debris and these small particles are taken away by the wind or water and when it uh, gets contaminated uh, inside the water then this water runs all uh, across uh, the stream and then it, it, it might flood or it might uh, create pollution there so you have to control both the erosion and waterway sedimentation. This might give you an idea and I'm sure you have seen these uh, parameters or these uh, type of uh, controlling procedures. Silt uh, fencing, erosion control blankets, mulching, sedimentation or sediment traps are where you uh, trap this water and this has to be drained by the way. You collect all the sturdy water so that it does not go on to the adjacent sites and then you uh, drain it with the uh, with the pumps or whatever way available so these are kind of self uh, explanatory and the documentation you have to submit to uh, for this prerequisite is compliance with the EPA the construction general permit or comparison with the local standard as I have said if EPA and CGP is not there and you have to document your erosion and sedimentation control procedures. You have to prove it by photos. For example, the photos you can see up here. And PR, this is a prerequisite, so you cannot skip it. It's mandatory. It has to be there if you want to apply for LEED. And it applies to zero lot lines projects as well. Zero uh, lot lines where 
the project or the lead building is kind of this ha having the same boundary like the property boundary. Credit one site assessment. It's just to research and analyze site conditions. Uh, but it's interesting to know that if you complete and document this survey that says that it includes seven assessments like topography, climate, hydrology, and so on, you would be surprised to know that if it is done uh, as early as possible, like in the pre-design process, and this is recommended to do in pre-design process, it can impact dozens of lead credits and prerequisites like location and transportation, some of the credits uh, might be affected in sustainable site and even in uh, energy and atmosphere and environmental quality. For example, just if you know the climate, then it means that you are talking about the solar expo exposure, heat island effect potential uh, we have just seen, and uh, winds and precipitation and temperature which can help in uh, uh, for uh, the water, outdoor water use reduction. There is vegetation inside. So vegetation can give you an idea of the plant types. Native plant types is a requirement in some of the credits. And uh, it might give you an idea of the endangered species if, if uh, the site was inside that uh, habitat. And if the soils can give you an idea of uh, uh, if there was any contamination, if it was a prime farmland, if there is any previous development. So and human use can give you the idea of transportation infrastructure, distant properties, facilities, materials and effects. So there is a lot. When we go on to the other uh, credit categories and we, uh, we try to understand them, then this might be much more clear. For the documentation, site survey assessment plan or map and a complete USGBC site assessment worksheet, which is available online uh, and uh, or something equ equivalent in case you are outside uh, US. So this might seem a little bit straightforward, but it helps you too much if done in the pre-design phase. Credit number two, site development, protect or restore habitat. The intent is the same to protect and restore habitat. Uh, existing natural features should be conserved. And the requirement, there are two. The first one is to protect 40% of greenfield area. What is a green field? It's an area that has not been graded, compacted, cleared or disturbed that supports open space habitat or natural hydrology. So this type of site is usually not too much available. So uh, if it is, you have to protect 40% of it. And if not, then you have to restore damaged areas to provide habitat and promote biodiversity. Now, option one to fulfill the requirement two is uh, that you have to uh, restore 30% of all portions of the site identify, identified as previously disturbed by using native or adapted uh, vegetation. So, you have not only have to restore the 30%, but it the, uh, the plantation should be native. And if you have uh, uh, projects that where uh, floor area ratio that term keeps coming back again and again. So if it is more than 1.5 you can include roof vegetation as uh, the, the restoration part and again the, the requirement is that the plantation should be native and this is the formula for the restoration. And for the documentation for the option one uh, proof of previous development and restored percentage. An FAR is required if you have included the vegetated roof in your calculations. The option two is a bit expensive but easier. You have to provide financial support of 0.4 dollars per uh, feet square of total site area to any land trust. Could be a local, it could be international, based on your project location. And for, uh, you have to uh, submit the financial support calculations and agreement with the land trust. Now, exemplary performance can be earned by doubling requirement in either uh, option 1 from 30 to 60 or in option 2 from 0 0.4 dollars to 0.8 dollars per feet square. Credit number 3, open space, we're going to earn 1 point for all adaptations. The intent is to encourage interaction with the environment. The requirement is to have outdoor space 
for 30% of the total land out of which 25% should be vegetated. And it should be accessible in case uh, there is a garden, it should be accessible to the occupants. An overhead vegetated canopy counts if, if again, FAR is more than 1.5. Unfortunately, the turf does not count. Now, if you see, the synergies have started to kick in. We have just seen in, in the restore habitat that uh, a vegetated roof can be counted if FAR is more than 1.5. So if you fulfill that requirement, you can also uh, re uh, fulfill the requirement of an open space. So you, we will see it when we move on that so many credits are uh, helping or having synergies with the other credits. Uh, and the documentation here is uh, to submit the site, site plan with location and size of open spaces because we have to qualify for uh, the 30% and then 25% of uh, the vegetation. So you have to submit the proofs for all that. And uh, in case of vegetated roof, FAR should be there. Uh, this is the example that you can see there is a vegetated roof. There is it's some famous building in US and the other one where you have a small vegetation on the corner and it's an open space. Credit for rainwater management, two to three points in all adaptations. The intended requirement is kind of same to reduce runoff volume and replication of natural hydrology. The option number one, it says to, to manage percentile of rainfall events. Now, uh, there is some authority or some uh, organization that is going to have the numbers of how much rainfall uh, is happening or a precipitation happening in certain areas. You have to get this number and it means that certain percentile, for example, the 95 percentile means that 95 percent of the time, this is the number of or the amount of rain that happens uh, or precipitation happens in this area. Now, to manage on-site runoff from developed site using LID and GI techniques, LID stands for low impact development and GI stands for green infrastructure. We're going to see it in the next slide and it must meet EPA requirements. So to manage 95th person, 95 percentile of uh, uh, events, rainfall, you will earn two points for healthcare one, 98, three and two respectively. And for 85 percentile, if you are able to manage with zero lot line, it's going to serve the same purpose. Uh, zero lot line, we know that when... Uh, the lead project boundary is almost equal to the property boundary. So you'll get, uh, it's going to earn three points and for healthcare, two points. This is uh, a figure that might give you an idea about the runoff we are talking about. In case of the uh, natural uh, hydrology in, in the figure on the left, if you see that in case of any rainfall or precipitation, 50% of the, of the water goes down into the ground to recharge the groundwater. Only 10% is the runoff and 40% is uh, evaporated or uh, goes into the transpiration. So comparing it to the urban environment where you have the hardscape, we have the concrete, asphalt, the, the slopes that are directed towards the drain. If you see the deep infiltration is only 5% and shallow is 10%. So uh, making the comparison from 50 is only 15% which makes the, the big amount of uh, waterfall into a runoff. So what you have to do in order to reduce runoff is you have to reduce the speed of the water and you have to find a way that it should recharge the ground. So you have to reduce the hardscapes and uh, eventually it will also reduce the burden on your uh, drain system because on the way it will also get bacteria it will also get some uh, oil contaminants or whatever it's on the ground it's going to be mixed with the water uh, and if there is more runoff there will be more volume of water the water if it is to be treated it would be too much dirty and there is not enough uh, ground infiltration happening so uh, in order to uh, reduce the runoff you have to reduce the speed and you have to find a way to charge the water in the ground these are the low impact development and green infrastructure techniques we are talking about. One by one, if you see, it might give you an idea for the green walls or bioswales and green gardens. You can search what is bioswales. It's an interesting thing where you can gather water inside a ditch sort of thing and you have a filters down 
and it's it not only cleans the water but it also holds the water for the runoff and uh, for green streets it's the same that it tries to uh, bring down the speed then rainwater harvesting is a nice technique where you collect the rainwater and use it for some other purposes maybe for irrigation maybe if you have a proper structure uh, uh, for uh, plumbing or it, it can go to the to the WC for flushing for example and green roofs it's going to help also uh, for zero lot line if you have a vegetated roof up it's going to reduce runoff by by a significant amount and uh, if you see the permeable pavers uh, if you close it down or you search online you're going to see that how it uh, uh, slows down significantly the the water speed and then if it is directed towards the drain it's going to be filtered as well so these are some of the techniques there are more than uh, the one uh, mentioned here but it to give you an idea i think it's it's now clear that the low impact development and green infrastructure helps reducing the runoff and also to clean the water and to reduce the impact on on the storm or mechanical rain for the documentation you have to submit the rainfall event calculations for chosen percentile which you can get from uh, uh, the local uh, organization that uh, collects all this information one of volume plans detail and the strategies you have implemented to slow down the runoff uh, and to fulfill the requirement and zero lot line if it is you have to submit the FAR these are the first uh, op set of options then the second option is land cover conditions to manage the annual increase in the runoff volume from natural to post developed condition but how did you know or how would you know that the natural land cover runoff volume was this much this info can be obtained from water resource organizations and government agencies or libraries having the the historical data so you have to manage here only the increase from the natural condition to after your building development and the documentation that you need here is to illustrate the natural land cover that uh, from wherever you get this information you have to submit that this was the runoff volume before and this much needs to be managed exemplary performance can be earned and this credit if 100% of the rainwater is managed that falls within the project boundary. Credit 5, heat island reduction, 1 to 2 points for all adaptations. The intent is to minimize the effect on habitat by reducing heat islands. The requirement is to limit the amount of non-reflective hardscape, asphalt, concrete, non-reflective roof, parking lot, etc. If you remember, this was also important in uh, rainwater management to limit the amount of asphalt and concrete etc now before moving any further to the options i think we need to understand few terms in a bit more detail first of all come uh, let's uh, come to heat island effect urban area is significantly warmer than its surrounding rural areas due to human activities we can see the difference here if you the it's about two to three degrees difference in an urban area comparing to a rural area and why is this happening we can see it in the figure on the right there is heat from the road surface as we saw the asphalt and concrete issue and then there is heat from the vehicles then there is a temperature increase because you are extracting the heat from the building and releasing it into the atmosphere with the help of your heat pumps and heat from the building surfaces so all these factors combine and uh, this is called the heat island effect that uh, because of all these factors the temperature in the urban area is more about two to three uh, degrees celsius and uh, we have to find a way to mitigate that some other terminologies that we need to understand before we move on to the options is solar reflectance and solar reflectance index the difference is that the solar reflectance is used for non-roof materials which means that the things that are not used basically as a roof they are used to shade uh, but they are not basically used as a roof and it's also known as albedo just to measure the solar heat reje rejection how much 
it rejects based on uh, on a scale of 0 to 1. 0 means absorption, 1 indicates total reflection. But when it comes to the roofing materials, we use solar reflecti uh, reflectance index, which is not only that how much heat it reflects, but also how quickly a surface releases or emits absorbed heat and returns to its normal temperature because inhabitants or uh, the occupants is inside. So uh, if it does not emit or uh, uh, the, the if it does not emit the absorbed heat, it will be translated down and change the atmosphere inside the building. So for the roofing materials, these two factors are used known as reflective index, reflectance index, and the standard black is zero and standard white is hundred. If you try to uh, try to generalize both of them the more the better if you are closer to one or you are closer to 100 you are uh, uh, using the, the best of it and three year age sr and sris will be used in in the options it, uh, it should be used as per the american society of testing material standard uh, and the clause e1980 so now we are going to see the option now we know what is sr what is heat island effect and what is sri used for non-roof and roof respectively now for the options to reduce heat island reduction we know there are non-roof measures and roof measures for the non-roof uh, measures these are the structures or uh, measures that are not primarily used for the roof so it could be trees uh, it could be shade by energy generating system this is an interesting one because it also is used for synergy it could be used in uh, the ener renewable energy credit and then you could shade with architectural devices or pa uh, the paving materials could be used differently uh, but all these materials that you use for architectural devices and paving should have uh, an SR value of initially 0.33 and three year uh, aged for 0 0.28 we just said that it should follow the ASTM the American Society of Testing Materials and Shade with vegetative structures, open grid paving system. This also is a synergy for uh, rainwater management, water runoff. So the synergy is uh, starting to to make their their case. For the roof measures, it could be vegetative roof. Uh, it could be low sloped roof with initial SRI of 82 and three year age 64, and the the high sloped roof with 39 and 32 uh, three year age. This is the standard non-roof or roof calculation uh, provided by the lead uh, this all non-roof and, and vegetated roof and reflectance roof uh, should be uh, after equation more than or equal to the total side paving area plus total roof area now whatever we discuss now let's have a look uh, at all these uh, measures now this is the architectural shading it gives you a design on on the facade of your project and these materials that are used as shading should have the uh, sr values that we just discussed this is the second one is the shade by electrical generation systems this is photovoltaic uh, cells that are producing some electricity as well as uh, shading for uh, for the parking that open grid paving system this is the close-up now that we are talking about this is also uh, the low impact development technique where you have small gaps good to recharge water inside the ground and also to reduce the, the speed and runoff the, if you see the cool paving materials the color is different and these are more reflective from 10 percent to 40 percent for the roofing materials if you uh, get it coated with the right material it can reflect about 88 percent the vegetative roof you all know and uh, if you s just have seen that there is a different uh, requirement for low and uh, high slope proof the reason is that the low slope proof is kind of uh, exposed to the sun uh, uh, all the time almost wherever irrespective of the sun direction and position but the steep roof might have uh, a different effect when when this uh, rotation of the sun and the location changes so that's the reason there are different uh, <coughs> requirements for the slopes the documentation is to submit roof and non-roof area calculations uh, according to the formula and site plans with the measurement and you have to submit the manufacturer's document for SR and SRI values because the three year aged has to be used as per the ASTM this was the first set of options now e either the option one having roof 
and non-roof majors, or you can put parking under cover about 75% minimum and could be covered by vegetated roof or three-year aged SRI of 32. Uh, it could be covered by a renewable energy system in the parking. We just saw in, uh, in, the, in the previous slide the figure in the parking area it was covered by a photovoltaic cells and also underground parking would be acceptable. Since you, ha you are submitting a certain percentage of parking so you have to have parking calculations and SRI values for uh, the measures or, or the uh, materials you are using. Exemplary performance can be earned by full fulfilling the requirement in option 1 and 100% parking under cover and you will have a bonus point. CR6 light pollution reduction 1 point for all adaptations. Uh, the intent is, is to increase night sky access and improve nighttime visibility. You will be really surprised to see how much difference light pollution makes uh, to the view uh, for the sky. You might have traveled late night. I'm sure you have traveled late night on the highways where the only light sources are the oncoming traffic and the traffic that is ongoing towards your side. If you see the sky at that time, you'll see a significant difference from the sky that you are uh, usually seeing in an urban environment. Uh, if you see in this figure, uh, it same happens you are really astonished to see and, and surprised from where how all these stars have come from and why they are not visible in, in the urban environment. This is the reason, this light pollution is the reason and we have to reduce, this, uh, uh, reduce it. Now the requirement is to reduce the impact of artificial light by meeting up light and trespass requirements and the project to be classified under lighting zone defined by MLO, Model Lighting Ordinance. What does it say? It says that uh, there are different lighting zones, five of them from LZ0 to LZ4. LZ0 being no light at all, almost none, and LZ4 being the highest of them all possible, like for example the Times Square of New York, and, and the rest of it are in between. In order to fulfill the requirement, we have two options. Option number one is bug method or backlight, uplight, and glare. You have to control all this. Now, if you see in the figure, there is a useful light. Then any of the light that is going backside from the fixture is the backlight. It's, it's light pollution. And there is an uplight, which is also not required. It's going beyond our, our useful uh, light requirement. And there is a certain area called light trespass. This is like you are uh, disturbing the neighbors or certain areas where the light is not required. And it is also producing a glare at a certain angle for the observer. So any light that is extra trespass or uplight and backlight from the useful light is light pollution. Now how to control it? If you see in this figure if there is a full cutoff you can cut off the fixture and it will be lighting the area that is required and in this uh, figure they are showing that if there is a full cutoff and all the light is directed down you would have a better vision or a better look at the stars. Then there is a cutoff going at sort of uh, zero degree then there is semi cutoff there is no cutoff at all and you can see how it impacts the nighttime vision of the sky. Uh, so the manufacturer's manual shows the bug rating usually helping you out not to do any calculations and it should not uh, exceed the standard set by Illumination Engineering Society uh, for, for, for the addendum number A. And for light trespassing, it should not exceed the bug rating based on the mountain location and distance. The boundary, it's, ideally it should be, the, the lighting should be inside the boundary of the property. It should not trespass to any of the neighbors. However, it can be modified in certain cases. The lighting boundary may shift to 5 feet if it abuts a public area like a walkway or parking lot. If you see in the figure below, there is a parking, public parking lot and you can shift from your boundary away 5 feet into the parking lot. And if it abuts the public street or an alley, you can even shift it to the center of the street. The idea being that since these areas have to be lit, by uh, other means. So if your light enters these areas which are public, 
it, it will not be considered as a light pollution. So you are actually helping them out and you are paying for it anyhow. The third uh, option would be that the adjacent property is owned by the same entity. So in that case, it's, it's up to the owner and uh, you can adjust your lighting boundary as you wish because there is, uh, is no conflict here. For the documentation, you've got to submit your lighting plans with the lighting boundaries. You might have seen some lighting drawings, the people who are working in the construction industry. You would have seen the design for the lighting uh, for facade and all this wall washers. So these are, these are the drawings that we are going to submit, those sort of drawings, the landscape and all the external lighting fixtures for uh, the location of the fixtures and the measurements. And since you are using the bug rating, you have to submit the, the bug rating supplied by the manufacturer and the mounting height for the trespassing requirement. This is all for the bug rating method. Now the second one is the calculation method. This is when bug rating is not available. And in that case, some fixtures might be uh, fulfilling the requirements of, th of the backlight, uplight, glare uh, thresholds, and some fixtures might not. In that case, the average of all would be possible. It's, it is acceptable in, in this case. So you have to submit the, every, the um, bug rating or the calculation since bug rating is not available. So you have to submit the calculations for all the fixes and the average should be less than the standard. And for the trespassing calculation, this lighting softwares are typically used uh, and they generate the drawing that we were just discussing this outside uh, landscape lighting and, and facade lighting and wall washers. For the documentations, calculations for lumens per luminar that is what, that is what we are discussing since we don't we don't have a bug rating so we have to submit the calculations for lumens per luminar and lumens above horizontal should be provided in order to see the the light pollution the up light pollution and for trespassing team should provide greatest vertical illuminance value the bug rating and the calculation rating method would not be applied or there are certain exemptions from all these light pollution reduction calculations and it is hospital emergency makes sense you cannot limit the boundary of the lighting for the emergency should be seen from long distance same goes for the hospital helipad flag lighting is something related to the government same goes for the highway transport markers is for the safety stage or video performances are for a time being and it's required this much lighting by by the performance or uh, by the event the internally illuminated design will also not be considered or be exempted because it does not make any light pollution you can see it's a very small amount of light coming outside and any facade and landscape lighting that is automatically turned off from 12 to 6 a.m would not be considered as light pollution source well that's summed up for all the credits for all other adaptations let's come back now to the prerequisite number two and other credits related to healthcare school and core and shell. The, the PR2 environmental site assessment, uh, if you remember, there was a credit site assessment for all other adaptations, but it was optional. In this case, it is mandatory. And the intent is to protect the health of vulnerable populations, mean the kids and the patients, uh, by ensuring a site uh, is assessed and remediated. And the requirement number one is to complete phase one environmental site assessment as described by American Society of Testing Materials. And the first one is like the basic one. You just see the site, have a look at the site, you see if there are any historical records, you ask the people uh, from uh, the neighbors or if somebody knew what was the situation of this site previously. And based on that, you recognize that if there is any environmental condition and if in case there is uh, an environmental condition, then a phase two environmental site assessment is, is required. But we discussed this in the in the site assessment. That criteria is the same. Then you make the soil sample, groundwater testing, etc. And if it shows contamination, then remediation is required and necessary. There is the just like the phase one ESA is basic. There is the the most advanced one, which is phase three environmental site assessment, and can be conducted at project team discretion but this is the maximum you can go for and you will uh, fulfill the prerequisite anyhow 
So for the documentation phase, for the phase one, like historical records, visual uh, inspection and interviews should be provided, but it should not be less than one year. So that you will have a good history. And for the requirement number two, phase two or phase three ESA or local equivalent in uh, other parts of the world of uh, contamination remediation should be submitted in order to fulfill the intent and requirements for this PR2. Credit number seven, site master plan one point for school adaptation. This credit kind of looks into the future. Uh, if you have any plans for uh, development in the future or expansion. So it tries to ensure the sustainable site benefits that you have achieved so far in the project should continue regardless of your future expansion program. And the requirement is to achieve four out of the following six credits. Location and transportation credit, high priority site, and uh, rest of them are from sustainable site, uh, site development, open space, rainwater management, heat island reduction, and uh, light pollution reduction. You have to achieve four out of these following six credits and then have to recalculate them incorporating the future development conditions. Uh, it means that you might have a plan for the future uh, expansion and you can put them in place uh, when you are calculating four out of uh, these six credits. The documentation is the site plan with the measurements and description including current and future phases of development. It's not a prerequisite so if you have a future plan and you have achieved uh, four out of the six credits you can earn one extra credit uh, from the site master plan. Credit number eight joint use of facilities one point for school adaptation only. Uh, this is an interesting one in the sense that you have to integrate a school with the community uh, of by sharing it with general public or have a contract so the idea is to share the buildings and its playing field uh, for non-school events and function after school hours uh, for sure so for the first option to uh, fulfill the requirement of this credit is to have at least three of the following available for public general public after school hours: auditorium gym cafe playing field joint parking one or more classroom stadium and access to the washroom should be given after school hours so uh, so in case anyone who is attending these areas or coming after the school hours to this area should not go uh, outside the premises or the boundary of the school uh, for the regular use of the washroom and the option number two is the first one for public the second one is to have a contract with the community to provide at least two of the following commercial office health cleaning media center, parking, one or more commercial business, etc. The third one is that now, first of all, you share the school facilities, the option one and two. Now, in the option number three, the organizations or the space owned by other entities are now shared with the students, like auditorium, gym, cafe, playing field, swimming pool, and, and, and stadium. So uh, it's like a community sharing uh, and caring uh, for each other. The documentation would be the sign agreement, uh, how spaces will be shared like the timings and and the washroom is accept accessible and all the stuff and site plan showing pedestrian access and distance from school to joint use spaces for option number three credit number nine ten design and construction guideline one point for core and shell if you have put that much effort in getting your core and shell project lead certified uh, and you have put all this sustainability and green building practices in place you would like all others like your tenants and the people who are renting out this space to follow the same idea and the intent of this credit is to educate those tenants about your sustainable design and construction features and they have to follow the same so the requirement is that you have to publish documents for the tenants and it, it should explain or it should have the description of sustainable building features goals including those for the tenant spaces as well that how they can blend in for uh, all this sustainable and, and and green building practices and information that enables tenant to coordinate space design and construction with the building system uh, so for the documentation you just need to submit these guidelines which you have produced or which you have printed or you have published for tenant design and construction Credit number 10, places of respite, one point for health and care adaptation only. Studies show that natural environment has a tendency to reduce stress and also offer healing. So the intent is the same, to provide patients and staff and visitors with the natural environment. 
So the requirement is that for patient visitors 5% and for the staff 2% of the net usable program area to be provided as a national environment. Now what is net usable program area? Inside the healthcare facility, too much space is uh, occupied, for example, by the equipment. There are some mechanical room, there is electrical room, there are storage room. So the net, net usable program area is uh, excluding all these spaces. You should not include the mechanical electrical room, the space occupied by the equipment, or for example, the infrastructure uh, occupied. So the remaining area is the net usable program area. And you have to take 5% of this for the visitors and 2% for the staff and provide it as a natural open air environment. The interior spaces might qualify, but for only 30% of, uh, of places of respite. And it would be in that case only if 90% of that space receives the direct light of sunlight with unobstructed views. We will see it in the quality views in our uh, indoor environmental quality credit category uh, in detail. But so if you have a, uh, let, let me give an example. If you have a hundred feet square uh, requirement uh, to be provided at place, places of respite, then 30% or 30 feet square will only going to qualify only if 27 feet square receives a direct uh, line of sunlight with unobstructed views. Uh, the third requirement is that it should be accessible. This place uh, should be accessible from within building or 200 feet from the entrance. And inside, you should have 25% of outdoor area vegetated, and there should be a seating space uh, every 200 feet, an option of shading, and there should be no medical intervention. The idea is to heal and to, to reduce the stress. Of course, you will not to see any medical intervention in this area. Uh, since uh, you are providing percentage of something, like patients, uh, uh, the net usable program area, so you have to provide all applicable, applicable area uh, calculations shading and vegetation uh, for the 25% of outdoor area and site plan within detail showing qualifying outdoor and indoor uh, places of respite in drawings or photographs uh, for the signage. The signage is that you have this place uh, for respite in this direction, just like a sign showing that this is where the place exists. Credit number 11, direct exterior access 1.4 healthcare adaptation only. The intent is the same, to provide patients, staff, and visitors, and to provide them with the healing and stress-reducing benefits of the natural environment. But the difference here is that, first of all, the place of respite was kind of commonplace for uh, patients, visitors, and, and doctors, or, or the staff, medical staff. And it was calculated ba based on the net usable program area, whereas the requirement for this direct exterior access is uh, it should be, uh, it's kind of more personal and it is based on the number of patients inside the healthcare facility. So you have to provide exterior, ex uh, exterior access to courtyard, balcony or garden for 5 feet square for 75% inpatients and 75% qualifying outpatient. Now, who will qualify? Anybody who has a stay of more than 4 hours will be qualified as uh, an outpatient. So now the calculation is based on the number of patients and you have to provide per patient five feet square in terms of balcony, garden, courtyard, whatever access they could have. And emergency patients or the patients who are unable to move in critical condition or they need assistance, they might be excluded from uh, these calculations. Uh, the documentation, you have to provide area and patient calculations and side plan indicating locations accessible to outdoor areas and distance between them. This will uh, conclude the sustainable site uh, credit category and uh, we'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much.